Now that we've centered normal subgroups as being the kinds of building blocks that we can make groups out of, and factor groups as a way of breaking apart a group along one of its normal subgroups into a group of cosets, now we have all the tool work that we need in order to do a classification of all groups in the universe whose order is the square of a prime number. So what can groups whose order is the square of a prime number look like? Well, if we recurse for a minute and think about what Lagrange's theorem tells us, Lagrange's theorem will tell us that the subgroups of such a group are pretty rigidly prescribed. According to Lagrange's theorem, any subgroup of a group of prime square order is either going to be the entire group and therefore have p squared elements in it, or it's going to be a subgroup that has p elements and therefore p cosets inside of my group. The third possibility is that we just have the identity element, the trivial subgroup. We won't draw that one here. So Lagrange tells us these are the only possibilities for subgroups of my group of prime square order. And the interesting one is going to be this one, because in this example, the subgroup consists of all the elements. And we can kind of think of a group that has this diagram here as just being a cyclic group of order p squared. But the group that we get when we sketch this picture is a little bit more interesting, because this is one that feels like should fit into the framework we've been talking about in this week's videos, which is about a subgroup on the one hand, a normal subgroup that has prime order, has order p, but which also has prime order many cosets. And we know that every group of prime order is going to be a cyclic group. The question is, if I have a group of prime square order, am I guaranteed to have a subgroup whose order is p? If it does exist, then that subgroup is going to be cyclic. And the factor group, if that subgroup is normal, the factor group by that subgroup is also going to be cyclic because it has prime order as well. But there's a lot of unanswered questions here. How do we know that this subgroup of order p is going to exist? And if it does exist, how do we know that it's going to be normal in a way that's going to let us find the factor group, which is therefore also isomorphic to a cyclic group? So these are the questions that we must answer to succeed in this classification theorem. But answer them we will to guarantee that either my group is a cyclic group of order p squared, so it kind of looks like this, has a generator of order p squared, or the other possibility is that it's isomorphic to the external direct product of zp with zp. And these, it turns out, are the only two possibilities for groups of prime square order. Either the group is a cyclic group or is a direct product of two cyclic groups of order p. One corollary to this is that all of these are examples of abelian groups. So there are no non-abelian groups, therefore, whose order is the square of a prime. We're going to prove this by a disjunctive syllogism, which is to say that if one of these cases does not hold, we will prove the other one must. So we'll begin by assuming that the first case does not hold. Assume that G is not a cyclic group, so it's not isomorphic to Z mod P squared. We therefore must show that G is isomorphic to the direct product of ZP with ZP. How are we going to do that? Well, first of all, let's diagram out my group. I'm going to sort of pretend in my mind's eye here that, that P is equal to 3, so we kind of have this 3 by 3 picture going on here. But remember, we're going to think of this as P by P, if you like. So if G is not a cyclic group, that means that G doesn't have a generator, and a generator would be an element of order P squared. So if G is not cyclic, then it has no elements at all whose order is P squared. What does that mean? That means that according to Lagrange's theorem, all of the elements in my group either have to have order 1 or order P. After all, Lagrange's theorem tells me, among other things, that the order of all the elements in my group must be a divisor of the order of the group. And if the order of my group is p squared, the only divisors of p squared that exist are 1, p, and p squared, because p is prime. And if we've ruled out elements of order p squared, that means all my elements have order 1 or order p. But the only element of order 1 in any group is the unique identity element. So what this is now telling me is that every single one of the elements in my group except for the identity is going to have order p. So I've got kind of a diagram here. All the elements in my group have order p, with the exception of the identity, whose order is 1. OK, so now what? Let's pick an element which is not the identity. So let's call that a. According to this, we know that a has order p in my group. And then let's construct the cyclic subgroup generated by a. So we'll call that cyclic subgroup h. It consists of a set of all powers of a. I'm going to claim that that cyclic subgroup 
is a normal subgroup of G. So it's going to play the role of this purple prime order subgroup uh, that we have here in our original diagram. So how do we know H is a normal subgroup of G? We're going to proceed by contradiction. Let's suppose that H is not a normal subgroup of G. Then that must mean that it's not closed under conjugation. So it means that there's some element of my group B such that BHB inverse is not equal to the set H. And by assumption, B is not going to belong to the original subgroup H, because after all, if it did, BHB inverse would automatically be equal to H, just by closure. So this, the fact that H is not normal, the assumption that H is not normal in G, means that there exists an element from outside of H whose conjugation by H gives me a different set than H. But if that's the case, that must mean that BAB inverse, which again doesn't belong to H, again because of closure, um, does not belong to H. And because it doesn't belong to H, we're going to use it, BAB inverse, as the generator for another cyclic subgroup. I'm going to call that one K. I'm going to think of it as playing the role of my first column here in this table. And because BAB inverse is not the identity, that must mean that the order of that element is P, because the order of every non-identity element here is P. So I have now two subgroups, H and K. H is generated by the element A. K is generated by BAB inverse, and each of those are subgroups of order P. Also, we know that the intersection of H with K consists only of the identity element. And that's because the intersection of H with K has to be a subgroup of H. But H is a group of order P, and therefore by Lagrange's theorem, either the intersection of H with K is going to have order P, or it's going to have order 1. It can have order P because it contains an element that doesn't belong to H and therefore it must have order 1 and be the trivial subgroup. So, we've just found two subgroups of my group G. The subgroup H, which has order P, the subgroup K, which has order P. Their intersection consists only of the identity element. Now let's think about the cosets of K. So I want to think not about the rows, which would be the cosets of H, but the columns, which are the cosets of K. And I want to ask, where does the inverse of B belong in my table? B, remember, was an element which did not belong to H. Where does its inverse belong? Well, it has to belong to one of the cosets of K. And because the cosets are indexed by powers of A, after all, that's how we get the columns in this table, right? The, the subgroup H generated by the powers of A, that means that these columns can be taken to be the cosets of K by the powers of A. So the inverse of B has to belong to one of those cosets. B inverse belongs to A to the power I times K, the left coset of K by the ith power of A. But if B inverse belongs to one of those cosets, that means B inverse is equal to the ith power of A times an element of K, but K is the cyclic subgroup generated by B A B inverse. So B inverse is equal to A to the power I times some power of B A B inverse. But what happens when you take the power of a conjugate? BAB inverse raised to the jth power is going to be BAB inverse times BAB inverse times BAB inverse and so on, J times. But those B inverses are going to cancel with the Bs in the middle. And the power of a conjugate is the conjugate of the power. I get A to the I here times B times A to the J B inverse. This jth power just comes in and rests on the A to the power J in the middle. Okay, so we're making a little bit of progress. But what we find out here is that this implies that B inverse is equal to something times B inverse. And the cancellation property that exists in any group allows you to multiply in the right by B in this equation and discover that the identity must be equal to A to the power I times B times A to the power J. But that, in turn, can be solved for B to tell me that B must have been equal to A to some power a to the power minus i minus j. So follow this through one more time. We took an element b which didn't belong to the cyclic subgroup generated by a, so it didn't belong in the first row of my table. Then we took b a b inverse, which also didn't belong to that first row, and took the cyclic subgroup generated by b a b inverse. We called that k. That's going to be a group subgroup of order p. Its intersection with h is going to consist of just the identity element because they're distinct subgroups. Their intersection has to be a subgroup of a group of order P, which, since it's not the whole thing, must be trivial. But then B inverse had to belong to one of the cosets of K. 
but as soon as b inverse belongs to one of the cosets of k, that gives us an equation which, when we solve it for b, shows that b must have been a power of a to begin with. But if b was a power of a to begin with, that must mean b belonged to h, which we assumed could not be the case because h was not assumed not to be a normal subgroup. So we arrived here at a contradiction. So what have we contradicted exactly? We've contradicted our assumption that h was not a normal subgroup of g. So at the end of the day, we've just proven that the cyclic subgroup generated by a is a normal subgroup of my group g. But this is also true because we picked a arbitrarily. It's any non-identity element whatsoever picked arbitrarily. That means that any cyclic subgroup generated by a non-identity element of this group is going to be a normal subgroup. And therefore, if I just think about picking an x and picking a y, which are not neither one of them in the cyclic subgroup generated by the other one, and neither one is the identity, then x is going to generate a cyclic subgroup of order p, which is normal. y is going to generate a cyclic subgroup of order p, which is normal. Their intersection is going to be just the identity element. And therefore, my group is now the internal direct product of the cyclic subgroup generated by x and the cyclic subgroup generated by y. But each of those cyclic subgroups is isomorphic to z mod p, and the internal direct product of them is isomorphic to the external direct product, as we showed when we talked about internal direct products a little bit ago. And therefore, we've just shown that the group g is isomorphic to the external direct product of zp with zp. So the only groups in the universe whose order is the square of a prime number are the cyclic group, z mod p squared, or, up to isomorphism, the external direct product of the cyclic group zp with the cyclic group zp. And that lets us fill in a couple of more rows on our classification table of all the groups of order k up to isomorphism. So far we've been able to do all the groups of prime order, and we've been able to do all the groups of double prime order. Now we can do all the groups of prime square order. So on my chart, that's now going to get me L, uh, the groups of order 4, it's going to give me the groups of order 9, it's going to give me the groups of order 16, 25, uh, not 16, sorry, it's going to get me 25, it's going to get me 49, it's going to get me 121, uh, and so on and so on. So let's fill in the groups of order 4 and the groups of order 9. Those are order whose square is equal to, uh, sorry, it's the, the square of a prime, order 4 and order 9. So there's only two possibilities according to our theorem. The first possibility is that the group is cyclic, so order 4 is going to include z mod 4, order 9 is going to include z mod 9. And the real upshot of the theorem is that the only other possibility is it's a direct product of cyclic groups of that prime order. So the only other possibility for order 4 is z2 external direct product z2. And for order 9, the only possibility is z3 direct product z3. That also therefore implies that there are no non-abelian groups of order 4, there are no non-abelian groups of order 9, no non-abelian groups of order 25, no non-abelian groups of order 49, 121, and so forth. This is now a complete classification of all groups whose order is the square of a prime number.